thank you, thank you, everybody, for for showing up on a Friday. I guess for most of you, a Friday afternoon. Um, it is a warm Sunday morning here in, in South Florida. I'm happy to see that. For those of you who are paying attention to the weather here in South Florida, we do. There is a, a hurricane that is churning um, off off in the Eastern Atlantic, or something that's close to a, a hurricane, um, and and that's what that's what it's like to live here uh, during the summer. So. But this is not about, although it might even be a little bit about hurricanes, it's not about hurricanes. This is about the, the secret history of Kanban, uh, you know, and, and why it matters. So, you know, let, let's, let's just get started. Um, because this, this conversation or this presentation is going to be mostly about giving proper attribution to those people who, who really require it, uh, I want to start off with a brief introduction to a guy by the name of Darren Davis. My guess is most of you have never heard the, Darren, the name Darren Davis before. By the end of this presentation, you will be sick of the name um, Darren Davis. But this is, this is a picture of Darren. Um, and I want everybody to know that at least the first half of this presentation is uh, based almost completely on uh, both a blog post and a presentation that, that Darren has, has done in the past. So we're going to kind of walk through um, you know, his, his perspective for some of the things that, that he saw. Uh, from the beginnings of Kanban, um, take it up, and then you know I'll kind of finish it off with with my perspective and, and talk a little bit about the future and and what the future means for all of this. So, this is Darren Davis. We had a debate last night over which picture I should use. Um, he said he preferred the one with a mask. I have to say that I prefer that one as well, um, but I decided to use both anyway. So, um, Darren Davis was, as you know, if we go all the way back to 2006, I'm going to take you all the way back in time to 2006. Oh, and. I guess I should say a couple of things first before I get, I get going. Um, I am going to talk very, very fast. I'm gonna try and get through this as quickly as possible, hopefully to leave some time for questions at the end. I don't know if I'll have, I'll have that time, but I hope I will be able to take some, some questions at the end. Um, if, if I do run out of time, which I most likely will, hopefully everybody knows that there's another session a little bit later today um, that is, is geared to mo mostly toward asking questions about this session. So if, if you have a question and you don't get it answered um, right now, um, please, please join us later and we'll try to get those questions answered as, you know, as, as much as possible. All right, so let's, let's take you all the way back in time uh, to 2006, all the way to 2006 at a company called Corbis, C-O-R-B-I-S. Uh, Darren Davis worked as a uh, software engineering manager at Corbis at that time. Um, and as part of his duties as an engineering manager, he ran the Corbis sustainment um, area. And by sustainment, we're talking about, you know, maintenance on existing products, excuse me, maintenance on existing products, um, small feature enhancements, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was, that was, you know, what they called Corbis sustainment. Now, the sustainment process at that time was run in kind of this waterfall-esque manner. Right. They, they did this, this big planning up front. Um, the idea was that they would release every quarter, but of course, you know, that never happened. But what they would do is they would take a whole bunch in this planning, they would take a whole bunch of, of fixed scope, try to shove it into something that they could get done, you know, within that quarter. And then hopefully, you know, things would pop out the other end uh, during the release. Well, as waterfall projects go, you know, um, they constantly ran late. Um, they were never able to hit their dates, and because they were never able to hit their dates, they started dropping toward the end. They started dropping a lot of scope. Um, even when they did deliver something, it really wasn't quite what the customers had asked for. All the problems that you might expect for, um, you know, pro problems with, with waterfall type, running a process in a waterfall type manner. So Darren and a team of people were tasked with fixing that. In 2006, they were tasked with fixing this process. Um, and I want to run through some people, you know, on this team. And some of these people you may have heard of, um, but most of them, I guess, you, you haven't. And that's, that's, that's really rather kind of the point. So on this team were people known as uh, Dominica de Grandis. She was a configuration manager. Um, a guy, Mark Grotti, not Grotti for you people in the UK, uh, Mark Grotti, uh, development manager. Larry Cohen, which was, who was another development manager. Probably my favorite picture, you know, in the whole presentation, uh, Steve Weiss. Uh, my apologies, Steve, if you're out there somewhere and you, you see this, I just, I didn't have a picture of you and Darren didn't have a picture of you. So this is, this is what you get. Steve was an architecture analyst. I'll be honest with you. I have no idea what an architecture analyst does, but that was his title. And then of course, last but not least was a guy by the name um, of Rick Garber. Now, the, the reason Rick Garber is important at this point in the story is 
you know, throughout the middle of 2006, while this team was meeting on how to fix um, the sustainment process, Rick actually went to Microsoft and attended a talk by a guy by the name of, of David Anderson. And um, in that talk, Mr. Anderson um, purported or allegedly had solved all the exact same problems that Corbis was going through right now. Um, and so, you know, Rick listened to that talk and he's like, wow, you know, if, if these problems have already been solved, maybe we can take that approach um, that they were doing at Microsoft and do it at, um, at Corbis. So what Corbis ended up doing was, was engaging Mr. Anderson to come in and, and kind of help them out, ultimately leading to, to, to Anderson being hired as the director of engineering. Um, and part of, his, part of his role of director of engineering was to take over control of this fixing of, of the sustainment process. Now, this, it's very, very, very important right now. I wanna, I wanna pause for a second. I wanna make sure that, that, that people understand this because my guess is you're in your head, you're maybe fast forwarding, you know, maybe reading a few pages ahead or jumping straight to the punchline. And you've probably got this idea of the system that evolved out of this. Um, and I wanna take a step and make, take a step back and make sure that you understand what you're thinking is not what was going on right now, right? So in 2006, the system that Mr. Anderson was having the team, was directing the team to implement was based on, on this book. I don't know if anyone's ever read this book, Agile Management for Software Engineering. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful cure for insomnia. If, uh, if, if anybody wants to grab this and put this on your bedside table, you have trouble sleeping, pick up and, and read a few pages of this. But this was all that was out there at that time. And this, this is what was implemented at, <clears throat> at Microsoft. And so all the, all the design work to redo this assignment process was based just on this right now. Um, it's, it's even a little worse than that because not only was the work based on that, it was implemented in a tool called Team Foundation Server, TFS. I'm gonna to refer to that as, as TFS. Um, so you have, to, you have to, in your mind, you have, to, you have to envision what this really looked like. What they did is they took TFS and they configured it to be this really, really complicated web of queues and transitions and work items. I think they had 25 different work item types and 14 different queues and you know, thousands of different transitions. You know, I know I'm making that up. But the idea was that a developer would show up and they would log in as part of their sustainment work. They would log in and log into TFS and they would just look at their, their screen on TFS and you know, on their screen, all they would see is a single queue, just the queue that they were, um, that they were responsible for. They didn't see anything else but, but for their queue. And the idea was that when they logged in you know, uh, on any given day, that randomly work would show up. And whenever that work showed up, they would pull it in, they would start working on it, they would mark it as, as complete and push it on. And then TFS would take care of moving all, you know, taking care of those transitions and, and moving the work through the, um, through the whole process. There was no overall visualization. There was no explicit limiting of work in progress. There was no end-to-end -end view of the whole system. Nobody, all you did was look at your, um, at your individual queue. Um, you know, that was it. And the idea was, the theory was based on that book, as I mentioned before, was just by doing that, just by being myopically focused on your own queue and working on, on stuff when it showed up, that the, the system would magically balance itself, right? That it would kind of be self-managing and, and magically, um, you know, balance itself. Most of you probably know where, where this is going. So after a few months, of designing this process, getting TFS configured, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're ready, they're ready for this rollout, right? The rollout of, the, of this new approach. So Mr. Anderson comes in and he blesses it and he says, yes, this is exactly what I want for, for our sustainment process. I want you guys to do this. Darren and team goes off and trains the rest of the engineers, the rest of the sustainment team on, on this new approach, right? Everybody gets trained up. And you know, with with a little bit of excitement and probably a little bit less fanfare, Kanban launches. Right, this is late 2006. I want to say uh, November 2006. Um, I, I probably should take a step back and say, in those early initial design um, pieces, I'm not I'm not even sure that they were using the word Kanban. Darren and I were talking about this. We're, we're not we're not quite sure when the word Kanban came into the vocabulary, but certainly when 
when Mr. Anderson was first engaged, um, I don't think the, the word Kanban was even in the lexicon, but probably by now it was. And so November 2006, Kanban launches, right? Everybody's excited, everybody's ready to go. And immediately it flops, right? Not only does it flop, it flops for months. It flops horribly for months, right? Now what's going on here? Think about this from the, from the customer's perspective. Before in the waterfall process, at least customers were involved in, in this, um, you know, in the, in the planning, right? Now, and I probably didn't mention this, now there was, there was no planning, there was no estimation, right? Work was just supposed to flow through the process. So there was no upfront planning. So customers didn't have any necessarily any direct input into what was being worked at any given time. Worse, um, remember everything's in TFS right now. There's no visualization of anything anywhere. And generally speaking, the customers did not have access to TFS, right? So, and even if they did, there was no way that the customers were going to log into TFS and search that tangled web of queues and work items or whatever to find out where their item is. We're still, work that came out of the process slowed to a trickle, you know, but whereas before you could, you could roughly plan on getting, you know, a significant amount of work every quarter, now almost nothing was getting done. Um, I've, got a quote, I've got a quote from Darren here that I'd like to read. Um, so forgive me for reading this. He says, uh, Darren likes to say that at that point they were hurtling toward disaster, but that implies way too much velocity, right? The truth of the matter is that they were grinding to a halt, right? That's, that's a, a, quote, a quote from Darren, Darren Davis. So, so we've got really, 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 really extremely unhappy customers. Now, when these customers are unhappy, they're going to call somebody and they're not going to call, they're not going to call Darren. They're not going to call Mr. Anderson. Who are they going to call, right? Well, they're going to go, well, it's not Ghostbusters either. They're going to go um, to the, the head honcho, the big cheese, the CIO, right? So all these customers are calling the CIO, giving him an earful. The CIO at the time was a, was a guy by the name of Stephen Gillette. They're giving Stephen an earful and they're saying, Hey, look, you know, this process is, is screwed up, you know, something needs to be done. So Darren gets summoned, literally summoned into the CIO's office. Um, Stephen pulls Darren into the office and says, WTF, right? And he finishes the meeting, uh, Stephen finishes the meeting by saying, you, you, Darren, you have to fix this process or I'm going to have to fire somebody. Those were, his, those were his words, right? I, I might be paraphrasing, but that's, that's, that, those, those were essentially his words. You have to fix this process or I'm gonna fire somebody. Now it turns out that the person that Stephen was talking about firing was Mr. Anderson. A few months after this, Mr. Anderson was, was literally walked out the front door of Corbis Buildings by security, right? But at the time, there's no way for Darren to know that, right? Darren sitting there in the CIA, CIO's office thought that Stephen, the, the implication was that Stephen was going to fi fire Darren. And so you can imagine that was, that was fairly, fairly motivating for Darren. Um, so Darren goes back to the team and says, you know, hey, Stephen's really unhappy. The customer's are really happy. We, we need to do something to, to fix this. So he gets, he gets the team together and like, what, what are we going to do to fix this? And again, you know, think, think about their mindset at the time. They're thinking the problem is one of execution. It's not necessarily one of process. Obviously, the process has to be good, right? There, there's a book and there's all this stuff that's written out there. The process has to be right. There, the problem with is, is with us and with execution. Um, they'll quickly learn that you cannot separate execution and process, but we'll, we'll get to that here in just a second. So Dominica uh, puts her hand up and she says, you know what, maybe, maybe we should start running a stand-up. Right? So it might, seem, it might seem strange to you, but they weren't doing stand-ups at this point. Remember, a developer would come in, would just log into TFS and work on their stuff completely in isolation, completely silent. So Dominica says, you know what, maybe we should run a stand-up. Um, Corbis had dabbled with, you know, what they were considering agile a few years ago. Um, and the, the stand-ups that they tried to implement were, again, in Darren's word, had turned into open mic night, right? This is where, you know, the stand-up meetings would last for 45 minutes or an hour, whatever. Anybody got to say whatever they wanted and speak on whatever topic they wanted. Um, it, I mean, it was just awful. So Darren said, okay, you know, this is, this is great. We'll, we'll, we'll try a stand-up, um, but uh, I have to run it and it's only gonna last 15 minutes. Um, 
So, so Darren goes away and he's like, okay, well, I need, I need to do this stand-up. Well, what do we, how am I going to get the stand-up to run only 15 minutes? I mean, what, what are we going to talk about? I'm, there's no way that I'm going to get everybody huddled around somebody's monitor and just start looking through all the cues in TFS. That's, that's not going to work. I'm like, he's like, we're, we're going to have to get this work visualized and up somewhere that everybody can see all this stuff all at the same time. So that's when we had the idea. I was like, okay, well, let's, let's, start, let's put everything up, up on a whiteboard. He's like, well, what's that design of the whiteboard, you know, going, what's that design of the whiteboard going to, to look at, right? You know, we need to start thinking about what does this vi visualization look at? So I know you guys were all wondering um, when the hero of our story was going to show up. Um, I'm not quite the hero yet, but um, about that same time, serendipitously, I happened to be at Corbis doing something completely different. I wasn't involved in the sustainment process at all at this point, but I was there um, teaching a, a, a color modeling class. And for those of you who know anything about color modeling, it's, it's, it's a way of introducing color to, to class, um, class diagrams in UML so that you know, it, you know, by, by classifying classes using color, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll form in repeatable, predictable patterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not important right now. You don't need to know that. All you really need to know is that it's, it's this idea of leveraging color to communicate more information about what's really going on in the model. Uh, Kurt Kwame was a software architect, was in that class. And so as they're talking about what's this visualization gonna look like, it was Kurt's idea that said, you know what, why don't we, um, why don't we, if, if we're, if we're going to put this stuff on a, on a whiteboard, let's have all our work represented as post-it notes and let's have all our work represented. Um, we can categorize that work into different colors. And so all the work item types that are flowing through our system, we can have different colored post-it notes for that. Everybody thought that was a great idea. So, you know, within a week or so, they had a board designed and they were implementing a stand-up. And this is, this is the first, uh, the first kind of iteration of that board, if you will. And then another thing I probably should emphasize at this point, when they went with this visualization, there was none of this, you know, oh, we have to faithfully reproduce exactly what's in TFS. Remember, TFS was the problem. So their thinking was, what's a visualization that is going to help us to execute better? So it wasn't about this whole start with where you are now thing, it was, what is the visualization that is going to help us make our standups more effective so that we can start executing? They literally started with a blank whiteboard and designed their system based on that. Now, obviously, the design that they came up with roughly resembled what was in TFS because they were still managing their work in TFS. But no one, at no point in their thinking was, this has to be an absolute faithful representation of, of TFS. There was none of this, let's start with where we are now. There was none of this, let's respect roles. Because the idea of the stand-up was they were going to start, um, they were going to start pairing and swarming and, and working on this stuff. It was no longer, a, a, you know, a developer was just a developer and a developer just looked at their queue. A tester was a tester. They just looked at their testing queue. It was more like, let's come together as a team and let's see as a team how we can start, start working. So there was no, um, there, there was none of that either. There was, there was none of this. And you can see very quickly the board, the board, of, um, the board changed from here uh, to here. There was, I mean, the, if you can think of a part of the process that they could change, they did. There was none of this evolutionary change, you know, small incremental improvements. If they could change something, they did. Visualization, roles, limiting work in progress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It all, it all got changed in a matter of days uh, or even weeks. So this is where I come back into the, uh, you know, into the equation. So, so this, this first visualization was early part of 2007. So remember they launched in 2006, it crapped out um, February of 2007, they, they fix it. Um, I'm brought in uh, you know, about that time, about, about a month later, um, to take what they've done in the sustainment group and scale it across the rest of Corbis engineering. So one thing I didn't mention was sustainment at Corbis at that time was really only supposed to be 10% of engineering capacity. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take what they were doing in sustainment and scale it, scale it across, you know, 100% of Corbis engineering. Um, it's worse than that because they had just kicked off two big projects. They had just kicked off a project to completely redesign their website, the Corbis website, the customer facing Corpus website, as well as replace all their backend systems, all their, all their backend ERP systems with, with SAP. So not only was Cor were we scaling this to the rest of, of Corbis engineering, 
But Corvus Engineering was growing from about 10 or 12 people to, I don't know, 60 plus people in, in a month or two. Um, and what, what we did was ex almost exactly what, what, what I just talked about with Darren. We got, we got um, a group of people together. These, these, were the, these were the team leads. Now, again, this whole idea of respecting roles. Um, this is Calvin and Jay. Their roles before, um, their, their title was, was architect, was like an engineering architect or something like that. In this new world, they were team leads because we were scaling this out. We needed people who could, you know, who could be leaders. Um, so we, we, changed, we changed all their names from architect to team leads. We got together as a group. We literally started with a blank whiteboard and we said, okay, as a team, how do we want to work in this new process to get these new projects out? How do we want to work? Um, and we designed, we, designed a board, we designed a board, again, just based on, on that understanding. There was none of this start with where you are now or, or anything. This is, this is a picture, some of you have probably seen this picture before. This is actually a picture of our, our third iteration um, you know, of, a, of a board design. And we took it, and again, they weren't doing stand-ups and the rest of engineering, but we took it, we took it and you can see this is, this is a stand-up where not only were we not doing stand-ups, um, they were not doing stand-ups before, but now we're doing stand-ups with 40, 50, 60 people, right? I mean, we're talking about, um, about, you know, in my opinion, radical, radical change in a matter of days or, or a couple of weeks. Um, lastly, and <laughs> most of you, most everybody knows I can't do, um, I can't do a presentation without talking about class of service somewhere. Um, this, this next slide that I'm going to show you is pretty much a direct copy from Darren's presentation. So these are not my words. They might, they might sound like my words, uh, but, these, but these are not my words. And this is something that Darren wanted to talk about for that very first, for, for that implementation. We talk about classes of service. You know, his recommendation is don't do it. They cause fluctuation with, with flow and longer cycle times. Um, we tried as much as possible, tried not to do expedites, right? They weren't designed into the process as much, as much as possible. We tried not to do them. And we quickly stopped trying to do date-driven stuff, the fixed date stuff. So from the very beginning, I know a lot of people have this assumption that classes of service were part of Kanban from the very beginning. Um, that's technically not true. We, we did everything that we could to not do this stuff because we knew how much they screwed things up. And this is, this is kind of my, my favorite, favorite picture about that. Right? Okay, so to wrap up, because I've only got a, uh, you know, a few minutes left. Um, why, why is any of this important? Why, why am I spending, you know, half an hour talking to you about, you know, about any of this? And, you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, in, when we put it in the context of a, a global pandemic, you know, um, rampant injustice throughout the world, injustice and inequality throughout the world, you know, does, does any of this really matter? Yeah, pro probably not. Probably not. But, but for a couple of things that I really, really do think need to be said. Right, um, and let's, let's just take a step back. And as I mentioned before, pause for a minute and consider all the things today that you associate with Kanban. Right? Those roughly fall in, you know, into, in, into two categories. Um, there's the, th the, the, you know, the things that were developed by the team at Corbis, you know, that, 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 are, that are goodness, right? The, the visualization, the limiting work of progress, the, you know, the way that they were, they were doing stand-ups and things like that. Um, and then there were the things that were the hacks that were kind of bolted on later um, because someone didn't really understand what we were doing. And that's the start with where you are now, the evolutionary change, the class of service, right? And when you think about the goodness, really, I really want you to, to, to consider the people who really, really made it happen. A um, couple, couple of people I want to I signal out in addition to the names that I've mentioned so far, um, I don't know if anybody can, if you can see my mouse or not, but in the top center, that's Diana Kolomayets. Um, she was responsible, you know, in, in the spirit of revamping our whole process, she was the one who was responsible for changing our prioritization. You know, we went from more of that upfront planning to more just-in-time prioritization. It was Diana who really managed that and made that effective for us. Um, you know, over here um, on the left and, and in the middle bottom, Doug Burroughs and Tom Utterbeck. Doug, Doug was a... Um, a build engineer, Tom was a tester. These guys were extremely, extremely important in, in keeping us honest in terms of that systems thinking, that systems view of the world. As you can imagine, um, the, the first iteration of the process was really kind of develop engineering centric. Uh, and these guys really, really stepped up to make us to make us make sure that we were we were 
continually looking at the whole, um, you know, with, with the help of D Dominica, of course, on, on that part, you know. So unfortunately, from the very beginning, these people have had their contributions either ignored or minimized or trivialized or unfortunately just outright stolen, you know, and mis misattributed, right? Um, and, you know, I hope, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm, I'm going to read through, a, you know, a, a bunch of things here at the end here. There's going to be a lot of text, but I want to make sure that I mean what I say. Um, this, this, it doesn't take too much, uh, it doesn't take too much imagination to consider why someone might do this, right? But as I mentioned before, you've probably never heard of most of these people. And there's a reason for that. Um, and I want to make sure that I, I set the record straight. And you might be asking, Dan, well, why now? Why are we setting the record straight now? And the answer would be, yes, you're right. This is too late. This, this, this presentation is 10 years too late. It's 12 years too late. But I hope, I hope that it's never too late to right a wrong. Um, also, further though, because the Kanban community was kind of started based on this false pretense, if you will, for, for, for lack of a better word, false pretense, there's been some behavior that creep, crept, has crept into the, the community that has been tolerated over the years that, that just should not be, right? Um, I want, this is, this is what I want. I want a, a community that is for the benefit of all and not just for the profit of one. I want, I want everybody who participates in this community um, to, to benefit from them, to benefit from that. Further, I want a community where people feel safe to participate, free from sexual harassment, free from bullying, free from worry that their contributions will be stolen, right? How many people have tried to engage in this community and they've either been harassed or shut down, you know, because they've said something that maybe, maybe doesn't sound right. So they've been, they've been threatened with, you know, banishment and excommunication, or if they have contributed, you know, their contributions have been stolen and been, been mis like I said, misappropriated and, and, and miscredited. I, I'd love to be able to fix all these wrongs. I also want a community that recognizes that there is no single methodology or framework that has a monopoly on these right answers, right? We need to start building these bridges. So much of Kanban has, has been framed in terms of a conversation of us versus them. But, you know, you know given the work that, you know, lately that, that I've been doing with scrum.org um, and, you know, some of these other communities, why aren't we working together? You know, why does it have to be us versus them? Why can't we start working together, you know, to come up with some good answers? Because, you know, at the end of the day, our customers don't care whether it's called Scrum or Kanban or Safe or whatever. They don't care. Um, you know, they've got real problems that they're trying to solve. Um, and I think, I think we can do that. So with that, and I know I'm out of time, um, we've launched this initiative called called Pro Kanban. If you go to ProKanban.org right now, it's, it's really, really early days. The, the, the website you know, is, is gonna be updated in, 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 the coming, uh, in the coming weeks. But the idea of ProKanban.org is this is a community-based initiative um, whose aim is to bring that professionalism you know, back into the Kanban community. All the things I think that we've lost, all the things I think that we've strayed from, this should be our opportunity to get all those things back um, and right the wrongs you know, in, you know, in our history. Um, and I'm hoping, my hope is, this is, this is kind of a plea. I'm, I'm begging a little bit. You can imagine me on my knees or something, but I'm hoping you'll, you'll join us to help build that community that I think all of us, all of us really want. Um, and lastly, you know what, if you ever get the chance to see any of these people in the future, you know, if you ever get a chance to meet any of them, I want you to stop them. Um, and I want to make sure that you say thank you. So with that, uh, I'm out of time and I want to say thank you. Hopefully you have been, enjoyed this rant of mine, me being on my soapbox for, for 30 minutes. Um, a reminder that if anybody wants to learn more or hear more about any of this, I do have a session coming up. It's, it's 1230 Eastern time, US Eastern time. I, don't, I can't do the maths in my head, so I don't know what that is um, in UK time, but, uh, but I hope to see you all then. Um, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to take any questions, but I want to make sure everybody has enough time uh, to get to the next session. So thank you everybody for attending. Hope to see you a little bit later today and hope to see you as part of the Kanban community going forward. Have a great weekend. Stay safe in these crazy times. Thank you everybody. Goodbye.